What do you want to do with your life? That was the question that three Canadian friends asked themselves in 1994, as they sat in a Montreal basement surrounded by stacks of punk zines, vinyl records and cheap beer. They were bored, restless and rebellious. They wanted to do something different, something exciting, something that mattered. They wanted to create their own magazine, one that would reflect their interests, opinions and lifestyles. They wanted to create Vice. Vice was not like any other magazine. It was raw, rude and radical. It covered topics that mainstream media ignored or censored, such as sex, drugs, violence and subcultures. It had a distinctive voice and style that appealed to young people who felt alienated and disillusioned by the status quo. It had a cult following that grew into a global fan base. Vice was also not like any other media company. It was ambitious, adventurous and innovative. It expanded from print to digital, from online to TV and from news to entertainment. It partnered with some of the biggest names in media and technology such as Disney, HBO, YouTube and Snapchat. It built a media empire that spanned 30 countries and reached hundreds of millions of viewers and readers. It was valued at $5.7 billion in 2017, making it one of the most valuable private media companies in the world. As Vice Media skyrocketed to success, it seemed invincible, defying expectations and breaking boundaries at every turn. However, the media industry's constant hurdles and pitfalls caught up with them. Vice encountered financial woes, ethical scandals and cultural shifts that eroded its credibility and profitability. They struggled to stay relevant in a world where consumer habits, market conditions and platform policies were in a constant state of flux. The once renowned media powerhouse fell from grace and in 2023 filed for bankruptcy. But how did Vice rise from a punk zine to a media empire that defined a generation? And what ultimately led to their downfall? This is the story of the rise and fall of Vice Media. Vice Media was founded by three friends, Suresh Alvi, Shane Smith and Gavin McKean's. They met in Montreal in the early 1990s, where they were part of the local punk rock scene. They shared a passion for music, art, culture and drugs. In 1994, they launched a magazine called Voice of Montreal with government funding. It was meant to cover the alternative scene in the city, but they soon realized that they had more creative freedom and fun if they wrote about whatever they wanted. They changed the name to Vice and adopted a provocative and irreverent tone that appealed to their young and rebellious audience. Vice magazine was different from other publications at the time. It didn't shy away from topics that were taboo or controversial. It featured stories on drug use, violence, sex, crime, politics, religion and subcultures. It also had a distinctive style of photography and design that was raw and greedy. Vice magazine quickly gained popularity and expanded to other cities in Canada and the US. It also attracted advertisers who wanted to reach its niche and loyal demographic. By 2001, Vice had moved its headquarters to New York City and had become an international brand with editions in several countries. Vice's next step was to branch out into other media platforms. In 2002, it launched VBS.TV, an online video channel that featured documentaries and series on topics that were not covered by mainstream media. VBS.TV was one of the first digital media outlets to use YouTube as a distribution platform and to produce high quality video content for the web. VBS.TV also gave Vice access to some of the most influential people in the world. It interviewed celebrities like Johnny Knoxville, Spike Jones, Kanye West, Snoop Dogg, Dennis Rodman and Kim Jong-un. It also partnered with organizations like CNN, MTV, HBO, Intel, YouTube, Google and UNICEF. Vice's expansion wasn't limited to media ventures. In 2006, the company launched Vice Records, a record label that signed a diverse roster of artists including Block Party, Chromio, Justice, Black Lips, Snoop Lion, Action Bronson and Run The Jewels. Not content to simply release records, Vice Records also organized music festivals and events across the globe, 
solidifying Vice's reputation as a cultural tastemaker. The following year, Vice launched Virtual Worldwide, an agency offering creative services to brands looking to connect with Vice's highly engaged audience. With clients like Nike, Adidas, Levi's, Samsung, Pepsi, and Budweiser, Virtual Worldwide created campaigns that were not only innovative and engaging, but culturally relevant as well. From HBO to Netflix, Spotify to Airbnb, and Uber to many more, Virtual Worldwide helped brands tap into the cultural zeitgeist and stay ahead of the curve. Virtual Worldwide has produced several notable campaigns for various brands. One of their most noteworthy campaigns was called Backup Ukraine. This campaign used a backup generator powered by a bicycle to preserve Ukraine's cultural heritage during the power outages caused by the Russian invasion in 2014. As a result of this campaign, Virtual Worldwide won a Ken Lions Grand Prix for good. Another campaign called Logitech rebranded the tech company as a lifestyle brand that celebrates creativity and individuality. The campaign featured artists like Lady Gaga, Lil Nas X, Billie Eilish, and Post Malone using Logitech products to express themselves. This campaign also won a Ken Lions Grand Prix, this time for entertainment. Virtual Worldwide also produced a campaign for Coca-Cola, which created a new drink called Vanguard. This carbonated water infused with natural flavors and caffeine was targeted at Gen Z consumers who were looking for healthier and more sustainable alternatives to soda. Overall, these campaigns demonstrate Virtual Worldwide's ability to leverage Vice Media's expertise in culture, content and technology to create impactful and memorable experiences for brands and consumers. Vice's biggest breakthrough came in 2014, when it launched Vice News, a news division that focused on in-depth and investigative reporting on global issues. Vice News was different from other news outlets because it used immersive journalism, a style of reporting that involved embedding reporters with the subjects of their stories and capturing their experiences with minimal narration or editing. One of Vice News' most notable achievements was its coverage of the Islamic State. Journalist Median Dairie spent three weeks inside the extremist group's territory in Syria and Iraq, providing an unprecedented insight into the group's ideology, operations and brutality. The series of reports won both a Peabody Award and an Emmy Award for its exceptional journalism. Another notable series produced by Vice News was Russian Roulette, which delved into the conflict in Ukraine from both sides of the front line. The series provided a revealing look at the violence, chaos and propaganda that fueled the war between Ukraine and Russia-backed separatists. The series was nominated for an Emmy Award for its insightful reporting. Overall, Vice News' dedication to immersive and comprehensive reporting on complex issues made it a trusted and respected source of news and information for viewers around the world. Vice News also partnered with HBO to produce two TV shows. Vice, a weekly documentary series that showcased stories from around the world, and Vice News Tonight, a nightly news program that offered a roundup of current events with a focus on digital storytelling. Vice News quickly became one of the most popular and respected news sources among young people, who appreciated its authenticity, courage and perspective. Vice News also attracted advertisers who wanted to associate their brands with their credibility and influence. Vice Media's success with Vice News led to more opportunities and partnerships with other media giants. In 2015, Vice Media received $500 million in investments from A&E Networks, a joint venture between Disney and Hearst, and TPG Capital, a private equity firm. These investments boosted Vice Media's valuation to $4 billion and gave it more resources and leverage to pursue its expansion plans. As a result of its investments, Vice Media launched Viceland in 2016 as a cable TV channel that replaced A&E's H2 network. The channel was a joint venture between Vice Media and A&E networks, but Vice Media had full creative control over the programming. Viceland's goal was to offer original and diverse content that reflected Vice Media's culture and values. Among the shows that aired on Viceland were Gaycation, a travel show that explored LGBTQ cultures and issues around the world, hosted by actress Ellen Page and her friend Ian Daniel. Weedy Cat, a documentary series that examined the impact of cannabis legalization 
and the prohibition on various aspects of society, hosted by journalist Krishna Endevolu. Noisy, a music show that showcased emerging and established artists from different genres and scenes, hosted by rapper Zach Goldbaum. Balls Deep, a documentary series that immersed viewers in the lives of different subcultures and communities, hosted by journalist Thomas Morton. And Fuck That's Delicious, a food show that followed rapper Action Bronson and his friends as they ate their way through various cuisines and locations, hosted by Action Bronson. Viceland was Vice Media's attempt to reach a wider audience and challenge the traditional TV landscape. It hoped to attract viewers who were bored or delusioned with mainstream media and who wanted something more authentic, diverse and edgy. Viceland also hoped to generate more revenue from advertising and subscription fees. Vice Media's growth and success in this period made it one of the most influential and valuable media companies in the world. It had a global reach, a loyal fan base, a strong brand identity, and a reputation for innovation and quality. It also had a charismatic leader in Shane Smith, who was seen as a visionary and a rebel in the media industry. Vice Media seemed unstoppable and invincible. The Downfall However, Vice Media's peak also marked the beginning of its downfall. In 2017, Vice Media faced a series of scandals and setbacks that exposed its flaws and weaknesses. It also faced increased competition and challenges from other media players, who adapted to the changing market and consumer preferences. One of the biggest scandals that hit Vice Media was the revelation of widespread sexual harassment and misconduct within the company. In December 2017, the New York Times published an investigation that detailed multiple allegations of sexual harassment, assault, discrimination and retaliation against female employees by male executives and managers at Vice Media. The investigation also revealed that Vice Media had paid settlements to at least four women who had accused its employees of harassment or defamation. The New York Times report sparked outrage and criticism from the public, the media and the industry. It also damaged Vice Media's image as a progressive and inclusive company that championed diversity and social justice. It exposed the hypocrisy and toxicity of its culture, which was dominated by male ego, power and privilege. In response to the scandal, Vice Media apologized for its behavior and promised to take action to improve its work environment and policies. It hired a new chief human resources officer, fired or suspended several employees involved in the allegations created an advisory board on diversity and inclusion, implemented mandatory training or harassment prevention, increased female representation in leadership positions, and revised its code of conduct. However, these measures were not enough to restore trust and confidence in Vice Media. Many people saw its apology as insincere and a little too late. Many former and current employees expressed their anger and disappointment with Vice Media's leadership and culture. Some also questioned the credibility and integrity of its journalism, given its lack of accountability and transparency. The sexual harassment scandal was not the only problem that Vice Media faced in 2017. It also faced a decline in its revenue and audience, as well as a loss of its competitive edge and relevance. Vice Media's competitive edge and relevance also eroded in 2017, as it faced more competition and criticism from other media players. Vice Media's style of immersive journalism, which was once seen as innovative and groundbreaking, became more common and less distinctive, as other outlets adopted similar approaches or produced better quality content. Vice Media's voice and perspective, which was once seen as authentic and edgy, became more stale and predictable, as other outlets offered more diverse and nuanced views on culture and society. Vice Media's brand and identity, which was once seen as progressive and inclusive, became more tarnished and hypocritical, as other outlets exposed its flaws and failures. Vice Media's decline continued in the following years, as it faced more scandals, lawsuits, layoffs and losses. One of the biggest blows to Vice Media was the cancellation of its flagship TV news show Vice News Tonight in 2019. The show, which aired on HBO since 2016, was praised for its innovative and immersive reporting on global issues. It had won several awards, including a Peabody and an Emmy, and had attracted a loyal and young audience. However, the show also faced challenges and controversies. It had a high turnover of staff and executives, who complained about the long hours, low pay and chaotic management. 
It also faced criticism for its editorial choices and standards, such as airing a controversial interview with Richard Spencer, a white supremacist leader, and being accused of plagiarism by The New Yorker. The show was cancelled after HBO decided not to renew its contract with Vice Media, citing creative differences and declining ratings. The cancellation left about 250 employees without jobs and left Vice Media without a major TV partner. Another major setback for Vice Media was the bankruptcy of its UK division in 2020. The UK division was responsible for producing content for Vice's online channels, as well as for its TV channel Viceland UK, which launched in 2016. The UK division also operated several other businesses, such as a film studio, a record label, an events company and an advertising agency. However, the UK division also struggled to make money and compete with other media players in the market. It had accumulated debts of more than 50 million British pounds by 2019, according to The Guardian. It also faced legal disputes with some of its creditors and partners, such as Sky, which distributed Viceland UK. The UK division filed for bankruptcy in March 2020, after failing to find a buyer or a new investor. The bankruptcy affected about 200 employees and several contractors and freelancers. It also resulted in the closure of Viceland UK and several online channels. A final blow for Vice Media was the lawsuit from a former employee who claimed he was fired for exposing corruption and fraud within the company. The employee Jason Mohica was the former head of Vice's documentary film unit and the former editor-in-chief of Vice News. He alleged that he was terminated in 2017 for reporting and investigating allegations of bribery, kickbacks, embezzlement and tax evasion by some of Vice Media's senior executives and partners. In the lawsuit filed in 2022, Mohika claimed to have uncovered evidence of various illegal and unethical activities by Vice Media. These activities allegedly included paying bribes to foreign officials and sources to secure access and information for their stories, receiving kickbacks from vendors and contractors in exchange for inflated contracts and invoices, embezzling funds from the company's accounts and budgets for personal use, and evading taxes by using offshore accounts and shell companies. Mohika claimed that he had reported his findings to Vice Media's co-founders Shane Smith and Suresh Alvi, as well as to other executives and board members. However, he claimed that instead of taking action or supporting him, they ignored him, threatened him or retaliated against him. He claimed that he was eventually fired on false grounds of misconduct and poor performance. Mohika's lawsuit sought damages for wrongful termination, defamation, breach of contract and whistleblower retaliation. It also sought to expose Vice Media's corruption and fraud to the public and the authorities. The lawsuit named several defendants, including Smith, Alvi, TPG, Disney, Fox, A&E Networks, TCV, WPP, Fortress Investment Group and New York City Ballet. The lawsuit alleged that Mohika was also a victim of sexual harassment and discrimination at Vice Media and that some of the defendants were involved in a sex trafficking ring with a ballet company. Vice Media denied Mohika's allegations and said that his lawsuit was meritless and motivated by revenge. It said that Mohika was fired for legitimate reasons such as violating company policies, mishandling confidential information and creating a hostile work environment. It also said that it had conducted internal investigations into Mohika's claims and found no evidence of wrongdoing. The lawsuit had a devastating impact on Vice Media's reputation and finances. It triggered a wave of negative publicity and scrutiny from regulators, advertisers, investors and partners. It also sparked a series of lawsuits from other former employees and contractors who accused Vice Media of similar misconduct and abuse. The company faced mounting legal fees and settlements, as well as declining revenues and profits. By 2023, Vice Media was on the verge of collapse. It had failed to find a buyer or a merger partner after several rounds of negotiations with potential suitors. It had also exhausted its credit lines and cash reserves. It was unable to pay its debts and obligations, including rent, salaries, taxes and royalties. It had lost most of its key talent and clients. It had shut down or sold off many of its assets and operations around the world. On May 1, 2023, Vice Media announced that it was preparing to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in the US. The company said that it had reached an agreement with its senior lenders led by Fortress Investment Group to sell its remaining assets and businesses through a court-supervised auction process. 
that deal would wipe out the equity stakes of existing shareholders such as James Murdoch, TPG, Disney, Fox, AND Networks, TCV, WPP, and Smith. The company said that it hoped to complete the sale by the end of the year and emerge from bankruptcy as a leaner and more focused organization. However, many analysts doubted that Vice Media would be able to survive the bankruptcy process or find a viable buyer. They pointed out that the company had lost its competitive edge and relevance in the digital media landscape. They also noted that the company faced numerous legal challenges and liabilities from its creditors, suppliers, partners, regulators, and former employees. They estimated that the company's value had plummeted to less than $400 million, a fraction of its peak valuation of $5.7 billion in 2017. The bankruptcy of Vice Media marked the end of an era for one of the most ambitious and controversial media ventures of the 21st century. It also signaled the downfall of Smith, who had co-founded Vice as a punk magazine in Montreal in 1994 and transformed it into a global multimedia empire with offices in more than 30 countries. Smith had been hailed as a visionary leader and a media mogul who had reinvented journalism for the digital age. He had also been criticized as a reckless gambler and a ruthless boss who had exploited his workers and partners for his own gain. But what does the future hold for Vice Media? Will it be able to survive and thrive under new ownership and direction? Will it be able to regain its reputation and relevance in the media landscape? Will it be able to adapt and innovate in the face of new challenges and opportunities?